What's up, y'all? This is Rebel Matic, and this is only the official. Rebel Matic presents only the official. Our guest for today is from Leftover Crack, um, New York City legend. I know he probably doesn't like to hear the term legend, but you know, I know he doesn't like to hear that term. But uh, I don't want to hear New York City so much, man. Okay, we just said it once. We yeah. said it one time. We said it one time. We're from New York City, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna say New York City. We have. Our friend Stizza Crack in the house, also a choking victim. How you feeling today? Yes. Stizza, uh, Stizza, what's good, man? Thank you for coming on the show, only the official. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the first question I want to ask is, um, how did you start? Like, how how did the band start? Uh, I know it came. It started from choking. Well, from no commercial uh, value to choking victim and to leftover crack. How did that whole process start? And what is the crack rock steady sound? Well, so uh, so no commercial value was was the first band I was in that was my music with my friends, you know. And uh, um, I met I met a uh, you know they, sometimes when you go to a new a new high school or something they they want to like send a person to give you a tour. Mm -hmm. right. so, Brown science and doing very poorly. <laughs> you know, I was like funking out of Bronx Science plus the commute was like an hour and a half each way and um and uh so I went to humanities and they they sent like this punk girl around with me who ended up being this girl Olivia that ended up being the singer in her commercial value and uh okay. and her then boyfriend at the time who was living at Sea Squat was his name was Vegan Mike. Now I think uh they go by Michelle and uh, I haven't I haven't seen years. And then, um, and then met Alec, our bass player in uh, the yoga class, which was um, the gym for people that that had a note to not be in gym class. <laughs> you just slept for a minute. Nice, nice. So and so that's where we met. That's where we became a band. Um, mm -hmm. in a real and C squat really. Right. And then uh, um, when when Alec left to join. He left to join the Spanish 89. Um, that, that was kind of a popular ska band at the time. They were, you know, if they ever got a record out, they probably would have been pretty big. Uh, our, our new bass player is this guy, Sasha. Sasha Scatter, as, as he's known by um, He uh, didn't want to use the same name. And uh, that's when Choking Victim happened. We called it Choking Victim. And um, mm. and we had, then we had a new drummer by the time that band started. And it was just me, a new drummer, a new bass player. So it was all three people that were not in, or two people not in no commercial value, so it made sense. And uh, and then Choking Victim kind of lasted about two years, mm -hmm. roughly. Mm -hmm. And by the time we were recording our, our first record, which ended up on Hellcat Records, we broke up and I was just recording demos of songs that kind of rejected by the drummer. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of considered that the leftover crack. And um, I put those songs together and, and got another record deal from uh, Hellcat and put together uh, Alec and, and Aro, who's now in the Slackers, as kind of like a, I hired him kind of to do that record. We practiced mm -hmm. for like a year and then we recorded it. Mm -hmm. I spent months on it, but they did like a week. And uh, nice. ever since then, it's been the leftover crack, you know? Right. Wow, that's much. awesome. And, and how, how, how do you define the crack rock steady sound? Well, the Crack Rock Steady beat is basically um, ska punk, but with influences of metal and crust, you know, and like um, kind of uh, it could go anywhere, you know. It doesn't it's not defined by a certain sound, mm -hmm. but you know, there's definitely got to be some ska in it, I suppose. Yeah. It Crack Rock Steady, and then it um, it doesn't it, it helps if um if your band is degenerate drug users. <laughs> that is, that, is that a prerequisite for being in a band? It's not a prerequisite, but it's uh, you know, it's it's held pretty solid. Um, <laughs> I mean, any member of, of Leftover Crack at least has is either in the throes of addiction or, or was for a very long time, and and you know, a lot of them have been sober for twenty years, so good for them. Right. That's awesome, man. So, 
Well, Carnage, let's let's go around. Everyone's gonna ask a question. We'll tie it in. Carnage, you got a question for us? Yeah, it's because here's the thing. What 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 I love, um, SZA. I never. I I remember seeing you. In fact, no, I shouldn't say I never. I remember seeing Choking Victim during which I would call like the last heydays of Lower East Side punk and playing in the venues and just practically killing it. In fact, um, Mark. O'Connell, the drummer from Taking Back Sundays, talks about when he used to see Choking Victim, and he was very excited when you were playing our pop-up show. So, what oh, I'm yeah. wondering, so how was it when you shifted from Choking Victim into starting Leftover Crack, like the transition of the scene, because this it's a, it's a weird time, because you were forming that around the time when New York City clubs were closing that really, you know, especially within the Lower East Side, and they hosted a lot of punk bands. Like, how were you able to take what you were doing with Leftover Crack and elevate it and move beyond that and let well, that not stop you? Well, well, like, in particular, like, for for me in particular, like, um, Choking Victim broke up, and I did, and, and, and back then... And I and to this day I do sometimes I'll spend six months working on my part of the record like guitars and vocals and mixing that mm -hmm. making it making sure it sounds right to me, um, and so we got that record done and then I had I was given a choice to move to Montana by a friend of mine that was mm -hmm. on on probation there, couldn't leave and um, she basically said that if I got if I come up there, that you know she'd like uh, house me and like mm -hmm. you know and stuff and and I wasn't doing really good that's probably the worst point in my life of like with drug use and stuff so I saved up a little money from some royalties I got from Epitaph and bought a, a four track and a guitar and had that stuff shipped up to Montana and that's when mm -hmm. I started recording dr all the demos for for the first leftover crack stuff mm -hmm. so I really had I had like a, a year or two between the last choking victim show and when Leftover Crack even started recording, because we were recording before we played a show. Okay. Oh, and then, nice. Um, and, and it was at uh, the end of the 90s, so I didn't, I wasn't even in New York for, for a couple of years much. Okay. So I didn't even notice, like, the fact is that Choking Victim could barely, we barely got booked anywhere anyways. <laughs> I bought 7-inch over to Coney Island High, and they basically looked at me and they're like, yeah, whatever. Like, they implied they weren't going to book us, and the only reason we ended up getting to play there twice is because once we got on Hellcat they did like they did like a Hellcat show and it, you know it's not like there was a ton of people there but it was like Dropkick Murphys F- minus the Pilfers played who were on Hellcat but um and the Slackers and we got to be on the bill because because of them not because we lived a block from the fucking venue <laughs> well, <laughs> not, well. they weren't friends with us another club tour you know only ABC and the Rio and and the squat and the squats that we played at were friendly mm -hmm. to us and I'd barely say ABC Nauru is friendly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we, there's another story behind that. If you don't want to get into that, that's fine. But <laughs> long enough time. Um, so, so let, let Ramsey. I, you have a. You want to go Alcatraz? Or you want to go Ramsey? Yeah, I, I'll go. I, I, so there's a lot of the um, music you were creating at the time. Um, you had a lot of resistance from the labels, like the first label you mentioned that you were signed to, uh, they had dropped you because they were, they became resistant to uh, releasing your material? Well, I mean, Hellcat, is that who we're talking about? Hellcat? Yeah, Hellcat. Yeah. Well, I think Hellcat, they were, um, they got caught up in the pol the politics of the fact that, um, like, I, that the record that I was doing for Left Over Crack was called Shoot the Kids at School. And that the <laughs> <laughs> was that the, the, the part of a, a line from the song Rock the 40 Ants, which I wrote before Columbine. And that's a, this weird shit happened because the guy that was running Hellcat, he knew about that song. And like when Columbine happened, he like, he got all freaked out that I had written that song. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and we weren't even putting that song, we weren't going to put that song on that first record anyways. We already had it on 7 inch. But, uh, once Columbine happened, and that was the title of a record, and all this, they then they they started putting up roadblocks and making it really hard for us to do work, and then they wanted to censor the art work that I did, and um, 
And basically, they not just that, but they went on to like make it so that I, they wanted me to change all the song titles and the wow. and all this. And it like became this thing where I just and the end I gave them like if you look at the artwork for Media Over Generica, it's not very good in my opinion. It's very generic, very mediocre. That's what, the, yeah, that's what I call the title. Of it, yeah, title of it, you know. And um, if you look at the back, there's like it says, um, it, I don't know, it says something in the ingredients. And if you just take out the extra letter from each word, it says the censored product, which initially I wanted to call it mm-hmm. Video Over Generica, the censored product. They wouldn't let me do that even. So I just, wow. yeah. Mm-hmm. You and would then, think, but, what? I was going to say, I said, you would think an independent label like that, you know, would like back your I- ideals or your, your well, music. You know? And well, back then, still, even as Trillion Victim was getting released and Leftover Crack was starting to generate a buzz, especially in New York, we still didn't, nobody really gave a fuck about us, especially people or like, they just thought they, that we were going to go away any day. They thought we were over, we, we're such fuck ups as people in their eyes, you know, as right. like being homeless people, being like train riding squatters and stuff mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. they could not foresee us lasting months from that day that they were talking to us even though they're still okay. releasing records um so what i think what they wanted was to sweep us under the carpet and then mm-hmm. have us put like most fans do and then nobody would give a shit that they censored our record the fact right. is though we kept going and we kept doing stuff and and now we're at a point where it's like if it happened now they would never censor our record today mm-hmm. right. we have uh, yeah. we have a following people know who we are and people care about us but back then nobody did so. I'll no, that's yeah. That's good. I'll that's try good. ask ask a question now because I... um well I have a question like the question that I have is a little bit weird because I noticed that the leftover crack they have like this conflict with the police and it's like a back and forth thing that and it's been going on for a while and yeah. I'm just really really curious to see like where how did that start like you know did you guys have some type of incident with the police that made you guys kind of like hit the police and be like, man, fuck these guys. Like, well, you know, cops I, and all that. Just growing up in New York City, I don't know, I can't remember the exact, like, event. I remember that my stepdad killed himself right before my 13th birthday, and um, I remember getting home from school that day, and there was police officers in, in our apartment. And I just remember walking in there and, and not wanting them to be there. I was like, why are these guys here? You know, like, and my mom's like, you know, uh, um, she, you know, she told me that that my stepdad killed himself, and and um, and the whole time I just like went to my room, but I was like, why the fuck are there cops on the phone? And it's like, what are they doing here? What? It's not a criminal investigation. This is like a suicide. Obviously, it's like they don't need to be here. Right. So right, um, right. there's that, but there's also like, I mean, I, I saw police brutality firsthand. All growing up, the whole time I was up, you know, like it was on my block, you know, it was it was everywhere. It wasn't. I was I, I kind of I don't know where it came from, but you know, I started doing acid and stuff like that in in, in junior high and high school, and um, and I was always just terrified of the cops, you know. I was scared of other yeah. people. I was scared of the cops. They're the ones that can kill you, you know. Right. The people so. that yeah. about me or my politics or anything, you know, they're the ones that are like against that. You know? And, um, fuck the police, they gain control, right? Well, yeah, but but uh, I, I, funny enough, I didn't actually write those lyrics, but uh, no, I know that was, that's yeah, 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 that was a I know more. I I didn't want to go into that, but yeah, I know I know you did a you did a cover from right. uh, Morning Glory, right? But the thing is that um that I remember when when Ice T and Body Count came out, and mm-hmm. uh, and the whole the whole thing about they made him apologize to the, yeah. the police. Yeah, and they, they yeah. took it off the record. Like Warner Brothers took that song off the record and made Ice T apologize to the police, and he told his stuff, it's like, "Oh, it's a fantasy story," and, I, and I, that's fucking bullshit. If you fucking yeah. hate cops for for the things that they do, you should be able to. You're an artist, you should be able to say that shit. Absolutely, uh, yeah, that's true. Back down from, from Warner Brothers or anybody, you should fucking go out there and say, "Yeah, fuck, fuck the police. They murder my friends, my family. You know, they they murder some people all the time." They deserve to be accounted for, and if if not through art, where else? You know, they're not gonna get put in jail. You know, what I mean, <laughs> they're still not somehow. You know exactly. <laughs> Blue wall of silence still continues to this day. Yeah, so, you ain't never, reckon- you ain't never lied. Been, there's always been a reckoning 
for them to have to answer for what they do and it and it's like you know slowly going but mm-hmm. who knows how it'll get buried in the next few months you know because mm-hmm. supposedly there's reform coming but what's yeah. that gonna be, you know it's a series so it's a series of events that led to that to you know that feeling about cops and all that right I mean, the event was me being a conscious human being in New York mm-hmm. City in the, you know, like in yep. the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, and just seeing the police treat people like they treat people, you know, it's much more concentrated in New York City. It's like maybe yes. out in California where they're really bad too, but there's a lot more room. You're not like- Yeah, like on the, top of each other. Yeah, somebody might be on the end of one block where like one or two people sees it, but it happens in New York City, you know, thousand people are going to see it before it's over you know and and and, yeah. and that's the thing you know it's like shame on everybody for fucking ignoring it you know absolutely yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. That, that, let me let's let me tie it all in because I, I, I like to keep it very um concise and i know we all have things to do so the questions are to tie it in what's next for leftover crack what's next for stizza um, how did you enjoy performing at the pop-up show? Um, and anything else you might want to add before we go? I don't want to... Well, uh, um, next for Leftover Crack is what's next for every band right now, which is waiting to see how these vaccines work out. And then <laughs> hopefully by May, June, we can all start playing shows again and touring again, you know? Mm-hmm. It's hard to say. I mean, I, and and who knows what the what the state of things are going to be like that because a lot of a lot of good promoters and good venues are going to be out of business. Mm-hmm. And so, how we, you know, what are we going to do next? I mean, maybe maybe mm-hmm. the future is pop up shows, and you know what? That's not bad, man. I, I, that was a great fun. And like, I'm always doing stuff like that, and I think we'll do that. That's the be the favorite punk band. Then we're going to be able to have like you know, a thousand people in the street watching a show. And if that becomes a protest, so be it. You know, every punk show. Right. Okay. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we, we appreciate having you on the show, and we appreciate um, you playing our pop-up show. Um, yeah, this is Rebelmatic. This is Stizzle Crack. Only the fish you want to see. You have anything else you want to leave us with, man? No, nah, thanks for having us. It really meant a lot, and um, it was cool. That was our last show with Alec, who who died recently. Yeah, rest, rest in peace, peace rest in peace, peace, peace to Alec, rest in peace, Alec. Yeah, yeah. Alec. yeah. rest in yeah. peace to yeah. Alec. Yeah. Peace yeah. Alec. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, that was that, that was just something. That all of us just meeting him that day, you know, ourselves, and and then to hear about it, you know, the um, you know, a, a week on my later, birthday. yeah, on, 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 my on birthday. your birthday, yeah, and my and birthday. if when I understand he's in the he's is he the original uh bass player of Leftover it's, it's Crack? Breaking up. Well, yeah, for Leftover Crack, yeah, yeah, oh, and, man. and he's been him since since my first real band that was no commercial value. He was a ba- you know, he was the first bass player, no commercial value, yeah, but first in the <laughs> but he was like the second and fourth. <laughs> you know, yeah. right, right, and, yeah. and then he was, yeah. you know, left over crack, and and you know, he he should still be here and be in whatever we do next, you know. But yep, right, yeah. Well, he's there with you spiritually, Stizza. He's yeah, there with man, you thanks. spiritually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we we appreciate you, man. Um, let's well, I, I, and well, before we go, because I know we got like a couple more minutes. For those who might not know, because it's very interesting, we have a, con- a connection through all this too. Your, oh, yeah. fa- your favorite MC yeah. is Ramsey's brother. <laughs> so let's go. Let's go into tw- let's go tell into tw- let's go yeah, into tw- you want to go into the story about how you met his brother, or you want to go into a- let's go to this. Tell us the story quick. How you met his when you met his brother, and how you met his brother, okay. and how you got and why you named yourself Stizza. So a crack. Okay, well, I mean, that, they're, they're not exactly, like, you know, interchangeable, but, um, but I, I, all I can say is, um, the reason why I loved the Wu-Tang Clan, like, when I first heard them, was because of the unique voice that ODB was. It, like, he was the fucking <laughs> that nobody had ever been like before, and nobody's been like since, you know what I'm saying? And, like, right. I remember, mm-hmm. um... I was in Cincinnati for a minute. I was like riding freight trains, and I was in Cincinnati for a month or two. And that's when um, Return of the Thirty Six Chambers came out, and uh, 
I remember panhandling the 10 bucks to buy the cassette at like the hip hop store in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> and we like went on a road trip to Indianapolis and we took a bunch of acid and we had like a couple of like half gallons of vodka or something. And we were like in this abandoned kind of like a, not a warehouse because it was outdoors, but it was kind of like a outdoor abandoned warehouse. Yeah. And basically we, we, we had this boom box, that cassette, I mean, we probably had other cassettes, but me and a couple of friends of mine, every time that the side stuff, we were like, flip it over, flip it over. We listened to that that record over and over again for probably like eight or nine hours. We had to buy a battery. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that's a serious ingestion. That's it. Wow. Looking <laughs> in that Charlene vibe this yeah. is it? <laughs> <laughs> There's something about it. And then, um, and so, so fast forward, maybe, um, maybe mm. years later, these came out, and um, I was in Montana. This is when I was I was writing the, the leftover crack records and stuff, and um, and I was visiting the Bay Area. Um, I was sleeping under the the the, the, the highway underpass uh, on Harrison Street, like in like mm-hmm. sticks. It's like Soma in in mm-hmm. SF. Yeah. And right when I got to town, I got off a freight train, and I was by myself, and I'm, I was walking down 6th Street off the market, and the guy kept dropping this, like, this really tall, kind of homebummy dude kept dropping all this cash. And I was picking it up and giving it to him, and after, like, he dropped it a third time, I was like, all right, I, I started putting it in my pocket. <laughs> and I the store, the bottom of the store where you get the, the, store where you get the, the tokens for the space toilets. Mm-hmm. But they're almost they're, they're like a quarter of 50 cents, but if you go to this one place, they give you a free one. And by the time I left there, I was like, this guy's just going to drop it. The next guy's going to get the money. So I kept the money, went to hang out with my friends under the underpass. Mm. We got a bunch of clonopins and crack, partied all night. And then the next day, oh, I, um, I lent my friend money to go see, um, I think, Mayhem or somebody was coming to the States to play at, a, at this club called the... Um, What's it called? Uh, it's, it's by Fisherman's Wharf. It's called like the uh, the Maritime Hall. It's oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. I like took like twenty five bucks out of that money. To, to, I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and then uh, that show got canceled, so we went to get refunds, and they're like, well, we could give you your money back, or you could have a ticket to one of the next shows coming up. And I saw ODB was playing in a couple weeks. I was like, I'll take that. I'll take it to get. <laughs> I'm not gonna buy one otherwise. So, so I went. Right. And the show was awesome. And um, at the end of the show, he was um, signing autographs from the stage for a second. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, leaving. And I, I checked my pocket. And my only ID I had was my New York City welfare ID. You know, it's what's on right. the cover of 36 Chambers, right? Uh, Return to 36 Chambers. And so um, I tried to hold it up for a second, but he was gone. And I was like, whatever. So everybody else is leaving out the club from the front, getting cabs or the bar or whatever. And I have to go back behind the club to go through the alleyways where my I'm, I'm sleeping on the sidewalk at this point with a bunch mm. of stuff. So I'm going back and there's like a chain link fence and I look and I see ODB talking to someone right there and I, I was speechless. Like, I, it's, I, only, I don't get tongue-tied that easily only a few times in my life mm. but I was like, I couldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking to someone who's facing me talking to somebody and I just grabbed my ID out of my pocket because I already found it and I held it up and he's like he just has this big grin on his face he stopped talking to where we were talking to and he had this big grin and he just kind of gravitated over to me to the fence yeah and I say hey blah 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 but I couldn't speak English no I'm not English it, was, it, was like, it wasn't the vodka either right <laughs> like a water pump like you or something but I yeah. right, you know what I can't but I have a pen, but he, he went around the backstage and just hit everybody up and came back with a ballpoint pen. And he signed between my name, signed Old Dirty. And I thought he only wrote Old Dirty for years. And finally, I looked at it a few years ago, and the really thing at the bottom is bastard. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it, it, was, uh, it, it was a trip for me, but it was probably as much a trip for him to see, like, a dirty white kid. Like, and I was, like, crusty. Punk, crusty as fuck, you know, like. Right. I, I haven't bathed in a while, you know, but I had my. Uh, hey. 
Seeing that he does not come home probably like was cool to him, you know. And right, like, right. Yeah. It was a very <laughs> moment in my life where I got to meet like one of my like my favorite like musicians ever, you know. And, and so years later, you get to meet his brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Look at that. How that works, life works yeah. that way. Yeah, <laughs> everything comes full circle. I get to work with you and play with you, man. So that's 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 a blessing. It's beautiful. Yeah, we got to do something else. Yeah, yeah. We just talk, we're just talk, we're talking we're talking about it too. I, I was playing him uh, a joint I did with um, your nephew with a uh, YDB and stuff. Yeah. And we're talking about that. Well, let's not put all that out there yet. But we, we, yeah. Yeah. I, I like you can watch, look on my Instagram. Like I, I was outside the Loud Anniversary Show at Radio City. I, I and I was like, oh, anybody man. got a ticket? Anybody got a ticket? And like literally, like twenty minutes before I was gonna leave, these guys had extra tickets. So me and my friend got in, and and I got to see me do like I never saw Wu Tang. I seen him probably like five or six times. I never saw him do full songs ever. Right, always right. Do a couple of Even if they're all there, they only do two verses. <laughs> but they did all the time. They did all the tech connect because YDB was there to do all the, the ODB parts and he was amazing, right, man. Right. He really killed yeah. it. Yeah. Great yeah, performer. That's up, man. That's great, man. That's great. Yeah, that's so cool, Stizzo. Thank you for that story, Stizzo. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, guys, you know. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, listen, this is Creature from Rebelmatic. Let them know, everyone know who you are. Y'all Brother Ramsey know. Jones. Carnage on bass. Like the trans guitar. Is and crack, gold blues, guitars, <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we, we appreciate you and look forward. We'll have all the links in the description and everything. Mm-hmm. We'll check it. But y'all, so y'all can check out what we're doing and check out what, what this is doing in the upcoming. And look forward and to if, seeing us. Go if ahead. you guys pop up a show this winter, man, hit me up. I might have a bit, I might have people to play it. Well, oh, we, yeah. you know, we, we, we definitely going to be performing once, you know, yeah. soon, you know, you might turn around, the sun might come out one day and you might just get a call. So, you know, don't yeah, ever be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, cause we, I, I'm, we, I'm doing a practice in a week or something, I think. So uh, I'm, yeah. I'm getting ready to do something. So We 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 are, too. We're practicing, too. Like, <laughs> yeah. we, I mean, we, we played a bunch. And I, was, I mean, you know, for, before we hang up. Uh, uh, tied up and shit like yeah. you know thank you too for uh, putting us on the the show which when tompkins we play and then you play oh, yeah. with us yeah. at um you know I at our pop-up like shop that it came up that that you're like i'm in rebel Matic and the set i've always oh. had to have a show coming up for you i'm like yo I'll put you on when i seen you on 14th street yeah 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 he, he was yeah. selling rebel Matic cds with the guys yeah. that are selling hip-hop mixtape yeah. i was yeah, like yeah. oh yeah, I know. And I was like, no, I was like, dude, I know. I, I'm like, yo, we played Punk Island together. You know Joe. And he's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, yo, yeah. hunt, just take it, take it. And then you're like, yo, it doesn't play. I'm like, dude, it plays. I just don't, you, I don't know if your CD plays. It definitely plays, but I'll send you some. He's like, yo, I got a show for you. Don't worry. You want to play a show? Yeah. What's name told me about you guys? Yo, let's play. I said, yeah, let's play. Cool. So, yeah, for sure. So, they hopefully. Were, they were tour together, too, one of these days. No, no, we're. Jobs, yeah, so. it's gonna happen. I mean, we, we, we all got jobs, but we we to mm. work. We ready. Our job is making music and, and you know party yeah. and, and and providing um some sounds for the people. But uh, that's no, our job. To me, when I ask a band to come tour with one of my bands and they mm-hmm. they can't, it's because oh I I don't want to lose my job. I'm like, what do you want to do with your life? You want to play music right. or wash dishes? Come on. <laughs> yeah, but some people got better jobs than dishes. Yeah, that's what, you know, yeah. that's what, that, some people are like, yeah, uh, how much? Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it gets technical, yeah. but it, it, it I is. That, it does, yeah. I mean, look, I, I me personally, I, I take jobs just to to pay bills and stuff. But I'm always, I'm, I'm more just about I'm not, I'm music. Be a little buddy that that needs a, that steady job, especially now when nobody can have a job hardly. You know, it's like um, absolutely, but, yep. yeah, yeah, that's true. I prob- if we take you on tour, like, well, at least you for your day job, so, you know. Yeah, but no, absolutely. Well, we're, 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 we're breaking up. I can hear. Say it again. I was, I, people, I think our fans will love you guys, and I, I think that um, that it'll be it'll be a, a good like neck and neck yeah. with what you guys get paid at your day jobs, you know. So. Well, that's okay. it. You, you y'all heard it here first, and only the Fisher right. Radio. He invited yeah. us to tour with them, and, and we, we're accepting it. 
So when, when, it, when, it, when it opens up, we'll, fix, we'll cross the I's and dot the T, cross the T's and dot the I's and make that happen. Crossing you know? the I's and dot the T's. We got a cross of my I's. Cross of the I's, dot the T's. That's right. A cross of my I's, dot the T's. I'm in a place to be. I'm crossing my I's, dot the T's. Oh, but well, listen, listen. You know, 2021 is to come out. So right. we're gonna we're gonna sign out. Appreciate you. Peace. Mm -hmm. They'll hear this in 2021 anyway. This will come out. Get all around the world. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the plan. All right. All right, y'all. Peace. Right. Right.